Welcome back to our series on the Unification Principles. I'm your host, Dr. Tyler Hendricks. What we have talked about thus far is God's ideal, and it is very idealistic. But human beings live in a reality of grief and loneliness. Every day, countless events that ought not to occur are occurring around us, and we can easily witness others' suffering and our own suffering due to such circumstances. We want to live a life where we receive plenty of good vitality elements and life elements, but to lead a genuine life in this world and the next, but it's not so easy. The daily news inundates us with stories of scams and brutal crimes, political corruption, and the suffering of dying patients. There are also many who suffer from physical handicaps, psychological problems, and sexual confusion beyond their control, who then inflict suffering upon others. In our daily lives, we're bound to experience the existence of evil. In reality, human beings possess an innate desire to choose good over evil. However, as we can see from St. Paul's confession in Romans 7, verses 22 to 23, all human beings are swayed by the influence of some evil force beyond our control. So we carry out the evil at which our original mind rejects. According to Christianity, the root of human suffering lies in the fall of Adam and Eve, the progenitors, of all humanity. According to Buddhism, all people inherently possess a Buddha nature, though they often fall into despair and suffering due to ignorance and attachment. Concerning this state of human affairs, Chun Shi insisted that human beings are born inherently evil, whereas his uh, a contemporary, Mencius, argued that human beings are born essentially good and only become evil when we are seduced by external influences. Well, what is the answer? The reason human beings have yet to eliminate the existence of evil and subdue its influence lies in the fact that we have yet to comprehend the identity of the source of evil or the subject partner of evil which we call Satan, and the manner by which Satan came to assume this position. Thus, it is necessary for us to first uncover the motivation and path by which Satan became, as his title implies, the adversary, and thereby open the path for humanity to finally eradicate evil and create a new history of goodness. The Divine Principle deals with this subject in the section entitled, The Human Fall. Let us first investigate the source of human suffering, the root of evil. Starting in Genesis 4, the Bible records an account of the fall. Genesis 2.17 states, but of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You shall not partake, for in the day that you do, you shall surely die. This was God's word to Adam, his son. This explains that the breaking of this commandment, the partaking of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, is the root of all evil, according to the Bible. Some have ventured to interpret this fruit which is, must be a very important point, interpret this fruit to be uh, of a literal variety, perhaps an apple or a peach. Could this actually be the case? What reason would the parent of humanity, God, have to create an enticing fruit but that would kill his children? Even fallen parents don't put poisoned fruit in front of their children that's going to kill them. Jesus professed that food alone does not make a person unclean. He said, it isn't what you put into your mouth that defiles you, it's what comes out of your mouth 
Matthew 15, 11. Also, it is impossible for the effect of literal fruit to be passed on and inherited generation after generation. So if we intend to clearly understand the nature of the fall, we know, need to know the nature of this fruit. And then we must first understand the, the nature of the tree upon which this fruit grew, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. However, there are only two references in the Bible to this tree. Genesis chapter 2, verses 9 and verse 17. And thus we will discover the significance of this fruit by comparison with its counterpart, the other tree that was right next to it, the tree of life. References to the tree of life are found throughout the Bible. In Proverbs, Proverbs 13, 12, we can deduce that the Old Testament Israelites desired to attain this tree of life. It says that hope deferred makes the heart sick, but desire fulfilled is the tree of life. In Revelation 22:14, 14, we can further deduce that attaining the tree of life remained the desire of those living even after the time of Christ. So it says, blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life. Everyone wants the tree of life. Since the ultimate desire of fallen people is to attain the tree of life, we can also assume that this must have been Adam's desire as well, even before the fall. Genesis 3.24 reveals that after the fall, God placed a pair, of, a pair of cherubim, angels with flaming swords, to guard the way to the tree of life. Thus, we can deduce that Adam's desire before the fall was to attain that tree of life. So what must have been the desire of immature Adam? It was assuredly to become a complete man, having achieved God's ideal of creation. So the tree of life represents a man who has achieved the purpose of creation. Now, therefore, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which stood next to the tree of life at the center of the Garden of Eden, must represent a completed woman, namely Eve. So consequently, the fruit of that tree represented Eve's fruit, specifically Eve's love. Eve, according to the nature of her love, possessed the potential to bring forth either good or bad fruit. And so the tree was referred to as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Therefore, the fact that they partook of the fruit is a coded reference to the consummation of a love relationship. However, the reason this was considered sinful was due to the fact that it was a love relationship that God had not sanctioned. It signifies that Eve consummated a love relationship with the one who first offered her that fruit, Satan, represented as a serpent. Then, what is the exact identity of this serpent who became Satan? According to the Bible, this serpent could converse with human beings. He knew the expressed command of God against partaking of the fruit. Revelation 12.9 reveals that this serpent's abode was once in heaven. He also possessed the ability to transcend time and space and in order to dominate the human spirit. What sort of being could possibly possess such characteristics? Besides God, Adam, and Eve, what being stood in such a position? There are no beings like this other than the angels. 2 Peter 2.4 reveals that the identity of this serpent who ensnared humanity in sin is none other than an angel. In particular, Jude verses 6 and 7 reveals that the angels fell and the reason for their fall was fornication. And I will quote the scriptures. And the angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah 
and the cities around them, since they, in the same way as those, indulged in gross immorality, in the same way as the angels, indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Now, fornication is an act that cannot be committed alone. Then who was the angel's object partner of fornication? Genesis 2.25 tells us that before the fall, Adam and Eve were naked and unashamed. However, Genesis 3.7 reveals that after partaking of the fruit, they felt great shame and they covered their lower parts with fig leaves. This fact indicates that their lower parts were the objects of their shame. Job 31 verses 33 and 34 leads us to infer that their lower parts were sinful. It says, if I have hidden my sin like Adam, we, when we do something wrong, we hide that sin. And Adam and Eve hid their sin. They were ashamed. And what they hid was where they sinned, and that was with their lower parts. Due to the first ancestor's fornication with the angel, all humanity is born to Satan's lineage, for we are their descendants. In Matthew 3, 7, John the Baptist reproaches a group of religious leaders. He refers to them as a brood of vipers, serpents, children of Satan. Likewise, in Matthew 22, uh, 23, 33, Jesus rebuked the people. He said, you serpents, you generation of vipers. Why then must the fall be of a sexual nature? Typically in Christianity, the fall is interpreted as the result of human ambition and disobedience in seeking to become like God. However, when viewing the Bible as a whole, it is apparent that the fall must, in fact, be of a sexual nature. The story of the fall, as recorded in the Bible in Genesis chapters 2 and 3, is said to belong to the J tradition, the Yahweh tradition of biblical uh, uh, redactors around 931 BC. The author was most likely a prophet during the reign of King Solomon. Now, what was going on during the reign of King Solomon? At that time, Solomon utilized the geopolitical position of Israel as a trading hub to accumulate vast wealth. In order to avoid war and stabilize his government, he engaged in a foreign policy of contractual marriages with the relatives of foreign regents. For this purpose, Solomon managed to obtain, in addition to his official wife, who was the Pharaoh's daughter, a harem of 700 consorts and 300 concubines. This is recorded in 1 Kings chapter 11. So Solomon went on to embrace the various idols that these 1,000 women brought with them from their own cultures. And he even built altars for them where they could burn incense and make offerings to these idols, to these false gods. Thus, the nation of Israel, which had forsworn to attend Yahweh alone, soon became a religious hodgepodge, fertility cults, worshiping Asherah or Anat, the goddess of sex and fertility, soon became prevalent. They were spreading everywhere. Fertility cults conducted fertility rituals in which the high priest would engage in sex with a temple prostitute, male or female, to represent sexual unity with the deity. Particularly in the Near East, people begin, began to revere the snake as a symbol of sexual pleasure, along with health and knowledge and fertility. Many children of Israel, the chosen people, they abandoned their commitment to God and began to revere such deities, thereby falling into sexual promiscuity. So it appears that the Yahwist author of that those verses in Genesis intended to reveal 
that the serpent, which many had come to revere, was not in fact a deity of grace, but a seducer and a deceiver, that this sexual deity, the serpent, was the one who actually brought about the human fall, causing Adam and Eve to commit the original sin and be expelled from the Garden of Eden. We should come away from this with the assured knowledge that the origin of human suffering and the root of sin is nothing other than the sexual transgression of our first ancestors, Adam and Eve. In our next session, we will explore in greater depth the motivation and process of the fall. This will reveal how the fall works in our lives and in our society and how we can reverse it and free ourselves from it. I look forward to sharing this with you. Thank you so much.